It's official. One Shining Podcast is back, and I am your host, Tate Frazier. And as March Madness begins, we're covering everything from Selection Sunday all the way to the championship and beyond. We're going to have great guests that are coming through on the show. And look, if you're a friend of the program and you're already subscribed, you don't have to do anything. OSP is back. It's going to be right back in your feed. And if you're not a friend of the program and this is your first time on the rodeo, then let me tell you this. You need to go to Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts and smash subscribe today because the OSP show is back. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July, I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Read, Write, Own, Building the Next Era of the Internet, a new book from entrepreneur and startup investor Chris Dixon. If you're listening to this podcast, you know what it's like to be part of a community of fans. You value the people who play, perform, and create for everyone. But what if there are more ways to support them, more ways to be a fan? And what if you had even more ways to connect with the teams, artists, and other creators that you love? Even though creators make the internet valuable, how much value do they get for their work? Well, that's mostly up to a few big tech companies. Shouldn't creators get more from the platforms they make successful? More value, but also more say, more control, more ownership? Read, Write, Own explores an alternative future for the internet, one that reclaims control for creators, fans, listeners, and gamers, the people who not only use the internet, but make it useful. Read, Write, Own imagines an internet built by us for us. So order your copy of the book today or learn more at readwriteown.com. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me in the studio, the Chip Gaines of the new Navarro, it's Andy Greenwald! Wow. You know what we didn't talk about? What? Is Chip Gaines buying Larry McMurtry's bookstore. I mean, Chip first Gaines, of all. Chip Gaines, for those who don't know, yeah. is uh, part of the Magnolia Network, yeah. kind of one of the core tenets of David Zaslav's you know, expansion into into. HBO yeah. Max country is putting the Magnolia content on HBO Max. I'm just thinking about what Face Kai is making right now. She thinks about the headline for today's podcast. <laughs> Did a new Star Wars season premiere last night? Yes. Are we talking about a essentially glorified property brother buying a bookstore? No. Slow Come your on. roll. Chip, Chip it, like, is really good at hanging Chip is a builder. antiques on the wall and being like, just his like, little accent up there, you know? Uh huh. Okay, go on. So Greenwald, your, great what, to see you, brother. You don't want to talk about the bookstore? No, it's all right. I just feel like I have an open mind. You so know what so I mean? do I. So do I. Like, I just think he's going to do right by Larry. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, uh, we've been proven out over the last couple of years is just, you know, believe in people. Yeah. And they'll never prove Their intentions are pure. I also think, and I don't want to step on what we're going to talk about soon, but I think that we should probably be forthright with our listeners that the reason we didn't make a bid on the bookstore is that we've actually been pooling our assets for a larger <laughs> purchase right. that we are going to be speaking about soon in this podcast. That's right. So uh, today on the podcast, we're talking uh, about the rush of shows coming before the Emmys. Yet again, we're going to do a little bit of Mandalorian. And then Andy has an interview mm-hmm. with Nick Kroll, which should be awesome. Yeah, Nick has his new History of the World Part 2, uh, a eight-part television sequel to the Mel Brooks classic film History of the World Part 1. A um, lot of famous people in it, a lot of funny people in it. It's really good and was excited to have Nick back on the show. First time in a while. Yeah. Uh, didn't he guest host once when I was out? I had Nick. Him and Manzukis. Nick and Manzukis came on in their alter egos as, I think they, they referred to themselves as the Finger Boys. <laughs> because they had, uh, the last time I had seen them prior to having them on the podcast was at the scenic Burbank airport 
where I was buying a needed coffee at seven in the morning, and I turned around, and Nick Manzukas and Nick Kroll were standing there. Did you just say Nick Manzukas? Sorry, and Jason Manzukas. <laughs> Nick and Nick, the two Nicks, as I like to call them. Yeah. Jason knows his friends call him Nick. Uh, Jason Manzukas and Nick Kroll were standing behind me by like the like the creamers and milks, mm. um, giving me the middle finger. <laughs> just that's good. Yeah. No, it was nice. It felt good. Uh, I love hijinks at the airport. It's the best place for hijinks. <laughs> uh, Andy, why don't we do this first at okay. the top? All right. Let me tell you about a little story about a guy named David Nevins. This is great. So David Nevins, for a long time, ran Showtime. Also, frequent guest on this podcast for a couple of years. I think he was on like three times with me. Yeah, I think it was more of an, an Andy project. One time he Not called that I, in. I would have rejected him. I just don't think I was invited. I wasn't CC'd on those No, emails. he called in during Twin Peaks The Return. You were there for that. Oh, yeah, I was. Yeah. yeah. When you were like, this is the only good show that's ever been made. And he was like, thank you. It was a classic AG interview. That, actually, Twin Peaks The Return is when I feel like you really sort of started to throw your lot in with like shows either are trash or the greatest thing I've ever seen. First of all, I've always been like that <laughs> about music and everything since you've known me. No, you, you, you were like more of a nuanced critic in your youth, I think. No, I was like, this is the, I was like, Swallowed by Bush is the only good song that has ever been made. And you were like, my brother. And then we did the Predator meme, and that's how we became friends. That's right. Uh, anyway, David Nevins, who oversaw, you know, the last, what, 15 years of Showtime? 10 years of Showtime? Yeah, he was head of Showtime. And then more recently, he was promoted. His purview was basically all of the CBS networks before the more recent shakeup and then his eventual ouster. Yeah. Yes. And so uh, Wall Street Journal reported this week that Nevins reportedly put together a $3 billion offer to Paramount to purchase uh, Showtime. Incredible. Back from Paramount. To rescue it, basically, from the fate that it has now found itself mired in that we were discussing, which is under the purview of Chris McCarthy uh, and the Paramount, and basically being rebranded as Paramount Plus with Showtime yes. and just going all in on its franchises and so a Dexter spinoff, many many billions, several spin billion spinoffs. Yeah, so a, I, a Donovan spinoff I, must be approaching. I think the idea being that David Evans was like, this is still a viable artistic and creative brand, and let me rest, let me take it off your hands for you, and we can have it be a distinct, worthwhile service. Uh, that didn't happen. No, and I, I in the bottom of the Wall Street Journal piece, mm -hmm. they said that this is not the first time that somebody has bid on Showtime to yeah. Paramount. That there was a something like a four or six billion dollar bid a couple of years ago. I don't That's know right. how that half the market value we, got <laughs> vanished. Or... I, I know how. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know how? Have you been covering television for the last few years? Yeah, but I mean, you know, $3 billion worth of value gone. Did, did you watch the last two seasons of Homeland? <laughs> I'm just saying. Chris, um, back of the notepad, would you rather own Showtime or the Phoenix Suns? Oh, that's a great question. Is it though? It seems like a pretty easy question. The Suns. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, like, much the same way you're going to have to be paying, you know, Paul Giamatti for the last five years of his career. Great point. You've but got the you've last got... <laughs> five years of his career. You know, he's, I think Paul Giamatti and Chris Paul are in very similar territory. Chris Paul Giamatti. Let's just do it. Let, right? How are those guys not in a state farm ad together? Look. Look, we're already monetizing our Jamadi investment. Let's wait. Let's 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 go big picture here. So, first of all, I am a hundred percent in on former employees being like, you know what? I'll buy the whole thing. Yeah, that is my. I, I would like. I would watch a movie about that. I would read any story about it, and I would love for it to happen. Just in real life, more often. I wanted to ask you whether or not. You you think this would be like a fun thing for a de a new development in the world of entertainment would just be a lot more mergers and acquisitions and splintering off of these sub brands within these huge companies where it's like, you know what? I'm going to come in. I'm going to yeah. buy this. Well, let me take shutter off your hands, AMC. It's weird that like Elon Musk spent what? $44 billion just to shit post. <laughs> you could buy a TV network. Yeah. Or a, Thank God he didn't. Though. 10 <laughs> sports teams. It just seems like such a weird use of money. If this I know. is the going rate. Okay. But to your point, I do think, if we're gonna, I, I, okay, I'd like to answer this in two ways. One, oh, you're right, because like you know what, if yeah. if Showtime was worth six billion a couple of years ago, you could yeah. just buy Manchester United for that. Yes, let's. What are we doing? <laughs> Everybody's wrong about everything. Because I was going to ask you, is like, should we buy a streamer? Well, yes. So the answer to this is yes, and we're yeah. going to talk about it. But in the more serious answer, I, I think 
it would be fascinating in this fractured marketplace, which is moving more and more towards consolidation. And we've say repeatedly on this podcast, like not all these services can survive. There's no way, there's no marketplace for all these things. There's going to have to be some sort of consolidation. Too many shows, not enough eyeballs, not enough potential subscribers, et cetera. What if one just became bespoke? What if, like what Jeff Bezos did with the Washington Post, where it's just like, this is a public good, you know, to to, to make yeah. the Good Lord Bird season two or whatever. <laughs> like, we were going to do this. Like, uh-huh. three women shouldn't be on stars. Sorry, stars. <laughs> we're going to invest in this. Right. Is there a, a, a path towards profitability? And would it be creatively disruptive for that to happen? It's interesting. We won't find out because the bid was rejected. They feel like Showtime still has some value towards the larger portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. Your question is the most valid one, which is, I think we should announce that the three of us have been meeting. Yeah, especially Kaya. She's the lead investor on this. Kaya (laughs) has been, Kaya's just better in meetings than we are. Sure. So we've been, you know, we've been talking to the street. We've been taking some trips up to Silicon Valley. My guys at Redbird have been very interested. Yeah. Blackstone. These, these hedge, the hedgies, they, you know, they love to take a meeting. And I think we presented a pretty attractive offer to them for us, yeah. the Watch Podcast LLC, to buy a streaming service. And we've been thinking about it. There are a couple options out there. We considered Peacock, but you know. So instead... I was kicking the tires on Disney+. Plus. Were you? Yeah. I just think I have a feel for the lore, you know? <laughs> those, we're, those stories are inside of me. We're, we're getting to that. <laughs> um, would you make changes for Willow Season 2? I, I, I mean, that's, that's proprietary information at this point. Oh my God, you're right. We can't we can't spook the markets. It seems like AMC Plus is the one that we should buy. Yeah, that's and the one that's out there, right? I feel like it's been out there for a minute. And I think that, um, especially since I moved the markets on Monday when I was like the night manager to an AMC Plus original. <laughs> and, and people came up to me on the street being like, sir, sir, that is an Amazon Prime show. And I was like, look, I just talk into the mic. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think. All right, Ron DeSanctus. <laughs> yeah. So, right. So, I think that's the one we should... I do think we should buy this. I, think, would, the, I think the campaign day, starts day now. Day one. Let's just give people a little teaser. Okay. Day one, what's our first movie at AMC? We cancel the Walking Dead franchise. <laughs> day, I, day one. Does, does the fact that there are multiple mm-hmm. multi-million dollar lawsuits uh-huh. uh, pending about the rights to the Walking Dead and the residuals... I, I can't comment. Yeah. I right. can't comment. I, you know, I've always been a Frank Darabont supporter. And um, did I just move the markets again? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I, I just think it's time for, for, for fresh blood. And I think if there's one thing that we've learned about zombies, fresh you, can, blood, you with, can kill them. Fresh blood with old blood. So I don't oh. want to deviate too far from okay. what made AMC the sixth or seventh most popular streaming Sh- service. Shawshank and, Redemption reruns. Well, look, look. Vince Gilligan's been a a really great steward of the Breaking Bad universe for a long time. I just think maybe he's not seeing all the angles anymore. Okay. So Mm -hmm. you and I come in. Yep. And it's just like, what about Breaking Good? Yeah. What about... This is us. A teacher diagnosed with terminal cancer who decides to spend the rest of his days doing good works. This is a billion dollar idea. And you're just giving it away. Just investing in Albuquerque. Yeah, infrastructure, <laughs> turning it into the Navarro of the American Mexico. Southwest. Yeah, I love this idea. Uh, I, 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 we're going to do this. It begins today. This is not a one podcast thing. Yeah, I think that if David Nevins can put together a three billion dollar offer, and I all do respect to David Nevins, who truly is one of the better creative executives of the last you know decade plus two decades, I think that we can put together. a I think we can put together a competitive offer. For you AMC. think that you and me can put together a bigger offer for Showtime? No, I'm not oh, for AMC. Showtime. Yeah. yeah, Showtime isn't for sale. And also, frankly, do, do you want to make British billions? Well, the thing is, is that we, we need to do is we should go try to get like Sundance now. You know what I mean? Like, there's probably oh. something out there that has like some mm. good stuff on its uh, in its library. Mm-hmm. Has like some brand recognition, and then we can kind of like invigorate it. There's a lot of goodwill there for me because of Rectify. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I feel like the Sun, the Sundance now doesn't Is exist. That IFC? Sundance, it, I think it got folded into IFC, which got folded into AMC Networks. Yeah, but it's there. Like, it's still separate, I think. Happened Leonard season four. Um, Let's do this. The all-time funniest purchase that could ever be made mm. by a, a single individual of a streaming service or of like a subsidiary of a streaming service, mm-hmm. and this is what I need to see before I die, <laughs> is 
Martin Scorsese taking over the MCU. Oh, come on. Yes. Just siphon off MCU. Yep. Marty comes in, deposes Feige. Yep. Uh, <laughs> every every movie, I was going to say every movie is now three hours, but they're already three they hours. They already are. Yeah. <laughs> and they're all about a search for God. <laughs> Again, I'm not seeing... You just replace that with Galactus, and it's basically the same yeah. thing. We're joking around. Are we? But one thing that's not a joke is the oncoming TV schedule. Mm-hmm. I'm a little bit worried for us. Okay. Last year, around this time, as we approached the Emmy deadline, which this year is May 31st. I think it's May 31st every year, probably. And we were like, God, they're really putting out a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And some of that was COVID backup. You know, we got to get it all out. Some of it was, I bet they made this deal when they made this deal with this pretty big star to, you know, headline this limited series or whatever. There was probably a handshake agreement, if not a written agreement, that you will be up for an Emmy. We will I, we will promote this as I, Emmy fodder. I would say it on the other. I would turn that around too and say that one of the reasons why streaming services and networks make deals with big stars at all is because you get the residual push of, of an assumed or at least hoped for or plausible nomination. Yes. It's just why you make the deal to begin with, because otherwise, what's your return on investment? Uh, I have advocated for Emmys twice a year. I've been shot down by yeah. members of the of the Hollywood community over that. Sh- should we should we buy the Television Academy? We are <laughs> cash rich right now. That's right. Cash, cash is so cheap right now. It's so cheap. Uh, I looked up just like a cursory look at what's coming out between uh, okay. now we are March 2nd as we record and May 31st, which is the uh, deadline. Mm-hmm. And keep in mind that there are lots of times like what will happen is like, oh, and, and then HBO announces suddenly like this is coming out in a month or something yeah, like that. Probably not the idol. Um, we should talk about that another day. <laughs> in March, Daisy Jones and the Six, that's this weekend. Mm-hmm. Perry Mason, which is on Monday. Ted right. Lasso, Extrapolations on Apple. Lucky Hank, the new Bob Odenkirk show. On our network. The Great Expectations uh, miniseries on FX. From Stephen Knight. Succession comes back. And Yellow Jackets comes back on the same night. That's March. Top Chef. Always loses the Emmy. But sure, but it'll be back. That's happening too. In April, Dave, Tiny Beautiful Things with Catherine Hahn, Transatlantic, which is a Netflix show about a group of evacuate a group evacuating refugees from Nazi occupied France. Not about Death Cab for Cutie. Waco: The Aftermath, the sequel to Waco. Great. So is that basically <laughs> just the last thirty years? Isn't the name of this podcast also Waco: The Aftermath? Isn't everything any of us have done? Mrs. Davis, Damon Lindelof, and Tara Hernandez's new show, uh, Dead Ringers, the Rachel Vice yeah. reboot of old crony. Uh, Somebody Somewhere Season 2, Love and Death, The Citadel, which is the long, gestating, Mm. very expensive Russo Brothers show, and Fatal Attraction, the reboot. And then in May, at least City on Fire, uh, and probably some other stuff. So that's only uh, 19 shows in 12 weeks. Secret Invasion coming? Isn't CR's number one with a bullet (laughs) pre scroll war show coming? It's tough. I can't believe there are two Olivia Coleman shows coming out in the next eight weeks. And is one of them Secret Invasion? Yeah. And the other one is Great Expectations. Isn't she in that? Olivia Coleman's in Secret Invasion? Oh, and The Great is coming out. The Great Season 3. Olivia Coleman is in Secret Invasion? She's joining the MCU? Yeah. What are you, high? Yeah. I didn't know she was. I thought, I know Amelia Clark is in it. I'm going to look it up right now, but if I'm wrong, uh, I'm going to give you 10% of my holdings of AMC. I believe Olivia Coleman has been cast in Martin Scorsese's reimagining of Black Widow. Olivia Coleman plays Sonia Fallsworth. No. Do you know who? She's Sonia. Fa- no, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> <laughs> She's in it? Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. This is going to be the, this is going to be our show. This didn't work last year. I think everybody was overwhelmed. I think yeah. everybody was like, "Oh god, that's a lot of TV." That's a lot of TV. I think that there was a lot of uh like, holy shit, you know, am I supposed to watch this this Jessica Biel thing? Or like, mm-hmm. you know, like whatever, like nobody actually, I, I didn't say that. But like, so I'm sure somebody A lot of was, people watch Candy. Yeah. Um, Not us. What do you think about Sorry, this? Sorry, Tim. Do you think that this is now the new normal? Is that we're going to put out 20 shows in three weeks? I, three months? I don't, because I do think that... Well, I guess all, we'll have a writer's strike and that there won't be any We are going to have a writer's strike. <laughs> likely to have a writer's strike. Um even before the writer's strike, perhaps, you know, but not unrelated to the writer's strike, a lot, there have been a lot of things red lit over the last few months, uh, ungreen lit, a lot of things slowed down, yeah. a lot of things canceled, a lot of things taken off the schedule, a lot of things just simply not bought. There will be a residual effect of that over the next six months to two years, honestly. So I think there will be fewer shows generally. But to your point, 
this is kind of where we're at. I mean, there is no moment that isn't contested for viewership and eyeballs. There isn't a moment when one streaming service isn't trying to establish a beachhead in some way, whether by taking someone else's corner or saying we do giant world beating fantasy now or we're still here or we're going to re- re- you know, reboot Breaking Bad, which is what we're going to do. Um, yeah, so I think it is kind of, unfortunately, well, again, we should always put the asterisk. It's unfortunate for people who have to at least make a passing effort to watch all of it. Yeah. It's still pretty boom times for the consumer. Um, and I think part of it goes back to what you said before, too, which is about the Emmys, which is every one of these shows is looking for some advantage towards eyeballs. And I think there is some thinking that if you can launch now and then get a nomination, get a nomination later, you can extend. Even if people watch it in June, you can extend the tail of your show. You can extend the interest. You can extend the conversation. Um, I'd also like to just take a moment to salute myself for scheduling a vacation (laughs) at the end of March. I think that was, that was, that was before you found out when succession was coming back, but it was also on brand. (laughs) Thrilled about it. Um, It's a lot of shows. What, what from that list are Am I most, interested in? I mean, I'm interested in a lot of them, honestly. Uh, Daisy Jones is a lot of fun. I want to check that I out. I really like it. I mean, it's also one of those things that I think uh, we get away from probably on this podcast, but sometimes a show is just about something you're really interested in. Music. So this is what yeah. Rogue Heroes was for me. I was like, I'm pretty pretty interested in the Africa campaign of World War II. Also, you've never been a Heroes guy. <laughs> but if they're a little bit... Roguish? Sideways? Yeah. Uh, so guess what? I like Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. I'm pretty interested in the 70s rock. And uh, no, I watched the first two and I really enjoyed it. You know, it's I, not like going to teach you, I think, anything you maybe didn't already know about 70s rock if you're like a huge fan of that that era. Yeah. But so far, I'm I'm really enjoying myself. That's cool. Uh, what else? Mrs. Davis. Yeah. Trailer dropped. Gilpin season. It's it's in this house. It's always guilt and season. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and Yellow Jacket season two. I'm excited for. I'm really excited for for Odenkirk coming back. Yeah, and you're a big Richard Russo guy. I'm 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 a big, great white American novelist guy. I'm not that Russo fluent, to be honest with you. But I'm excited for the show. I'm excited to see you know again like, to see what our new. Uh, employees at AMC have been cooking <laughs> before we like can we when we take over that business are we going to introduce them to some dangerous ideas like are we going like to be what? like well no I, I, I we, have, we better work Kaya make a note we should really workshop some dangerous ideas <laughs> I, I just like you remember New York Do Magazine you think this is an era of dangerous ideas That's, in corporate environments yeah I just feel like a couple months ago uh New York Magazine had the cover that was like inside Elon's hardcore Twitter oh you mean like fire everybody then I, hire them back. Yeah, I just feel like we're unpredictable. Then that, put the watch on AMC 19 hours a day. That's why the street loves us. <laughs> and, then, and then beg Walking Dead to come back. Please, <laughs> sirs. We've made a terrible We get rid mistake. of everything but fear the Walking Dead. That's Kim's on that. That's that's my yeah. one. Kim's back. Is she back on that show? Was she gone? Yes. It was a big it was a big scandal. So when when Kim Dickens was on Briar Patch, we would talk constantly about how she was inundated by, and I was as well, in a very loving way, many, many, many social media accounts, many of them in Italy, who are big, big fans of Kim. And as they should be, she's one of our great actors and greatest people. And uh, they were like, you are so beautiful. Please bring Madison back. They did Madison wrong. Yeah. Like she, they were, the character they felt was wronged by the show. And during that summer, they were reaching out to her and like, she was pretty excited to come to, to run it back. Eat Col- Coleman Domingo's on that show. Yeah, another one of our great actors. I think this is the this is our first plank. No Walking Dead except Fear the Walking Dead. Andy, nothing would make me happier than yeah. if you pivoted to a huge Fear the Walking Dead ha- fan and we're constantly referencing it and being yeah. like, "This kind of reminds me of season five of FOTD, the one, the one on the boat." <laughs> yeah, this is like you being boat. a Shazam guy. <laughs> that's that's your thing. Are we Mandalorian guys? Are we ready? Are we yeah. doing this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So season three. I still count myself as a Mando guy. Mm-hmm. There's just something about seeing Carl Weathers walking across <laughs> a beautiful town square. <laughs> Unbelievable. And being like, Mando! I need the leads! I need the Glen Gary leads! We're building! <laughs> Not this shit! He was in expansion mode. I, I So everyone loves that. 
I love it. Everyone loves that. I felt like... Man, do I have a great tract out here for you. Chris, we're... You and your son. You, you, <laughs> you joke. But we are at a moment of crisis for America's great cities. Yeah. Are they ungovernable? Right. You know, and like... Or has zoning... Our zoning laws... And ca- nim- capping our housing supply. And nimbyism. Yeah. Quite frankly. Not fucking Carl. No. Not grief. Like... Build what, up and build out. What percentage of the vote... And remember, this is like a like a... A, a, a top two contenders into a runoff situation. What percentage of the vote <laughs> Lightfoot style? would Grief yeah. Karga have gotten in the recent Chicago mayoral election? Did I send you the uh, the picture somebody had of Lori Lightfoot leaving a CVS with a case of Modellos? <laughs> no, but that's incredible. <laughs> this was post-election, I imagine. I think so. She just took a suitcase? She packed her bags? No, it was like you know, when, you go to, when you go to Walgreens no, and no, they're like they the 24th. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. You don't buy them as much as I do, I guess. <laughs> When it's when it's the weekend, and it's as I call that fear o'clock. Because okay. I fire up the season of The Walking Dead with a big suitcase of Modellos. And just think about No wonder you don't remember anything nope. that happened on that show. Just think about governance in the windy city. I, I think that he presented a pretty compelling argument for a new generation of urban leadership because basically, and again, you you had to correct me on this. My understanding of the Mandalorian timeline is that he just flew away and got the baby back from Luke, and then all of a sudden, Navarro is Coruscant. Uh-huh. Like all of a sudden. Yeah. It, what? How did he do this? There's a, what, gr- a great troop. So this is what is the Navarro miracle? We are getting to a thing okay. that I don't think you and I, as cash Mando guys, this is we our don't understand. There this. are there are there cash Mando guys anymore? Well, this is the conversation. Okay. So apparently, all right, it's been like five years wow. since this show started in Mando time. Wow. Not not only in like it's been what two years since Mandalorian season two. How many right? years since the Battle of Yavin? So John Favreau cleared all this up. Yeah. He was like the first two seasons mm-hmm. of The Mandalorian took place over the course of many years. Really? Yeah. Right? I, I sent you this text, didn't I? Okay, we actually you'll never know this guy's magic of podcasting. We <laughs> stepped down while Chris and Kaya taught me how to search texts. So we're doing great. This is gonna go very well in our presentation to, you know, the hedgies. Chris sent me a tweet. It said, uh, John Favreau clarifies the timeline of The Mandalorian. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Seasons one and two take place over many years. Yeah. Grogu was with Luke for two years yeah. before being reunited with At the Din end Jaren. of the Book of Boba Fett, which you definitely finished, right? A million percent. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Because when we did that podcast a couple of months ago, we were like, man, they're really giving away that these guys are reunited. Yeah, I... I- <laughs> I definitely was confused as to not just how much time had passed in the Din Djarin verse, but also in my own life right. since I last watched The Mandalorian because Boba Fett became The Mandalorian, essentially, near the end of its season. Did he? No, no, he didn't become it. The show became it. Oh, yeah. I was just, well, because you, you never were know ready, who's You were ready to believe it. And he's a scroll. I have no idea who's inside that suit anymore. It's not Pedro Pascal. He's, he's, he's not even claiming it anymore. I know. I appreciate that. All right. Well, let's talk about we love grief. Mm-hmm. We love grief. We yeah. love the cityscape. We believe in the Navarro miracle. I think the bigger point for me is something you just said, you just tossed off, which is like the casual Mando fan. Are we tipping into mythology a little hard? This season began with stuff that I have to fully confess to you, I don't care so much about. Sure. Never been a big Creed guy. You know? Oh, the Creed, not Creed, not like Creed Apollo 3. Creed. Yeah. I would watch that movie. Yeah. Not the band either. Creed I just 3 mean, apparently heavily influenced by anime. I saw that. That is. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, it's all, you know what it is? It's all Waco legacy to me. Was it Waco <laughs> Aftermath? It's all the Aftermath It's all the Aftermath of Waco, if you, if you really, really squint. Um, no, so it just, you know, the, the season begins with the Armorer and a bunch of Mandos. And some man does, I'd imagine. It's hard to tell in the armor. Doing some stuff. Doing some old, you know, religious order type of thing. Yeah. Where they put a helmet on a They're little boy. They're baptizing a little homie. And he's about yeah. to wear that helmet for life. I, I got a couple. I did have a couple notes about that. Just yeah. like, I feel like that's the wrong age to encase a person's face in a mask forever. Well, do you think that you you change masks over the course of your life? It's it's not just that. It's that that puberty age is a time when when young boys' faces are not the most you oh, know yeah. unblemished. Like sure. there's 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 oily buildup. You might need some Stridex, and you can't touch your face anymore. You know what I mean? I just feel like that's... So you think that really 
what we don't talk about enough is how the Mandalore are like riddled with acne. Ravaged with acne <laughs> yeah, scars. Because they do. just don't do enough Noxema. Yes. Okay. A hundred percent. That's my first note. My second note was just like casually, it's just like the more the more seriously. Yeah, okay. Big picture. Is it hard for us to go back to the show after watching Andor? Yes. But I do think they're very different shows and they should both be able to exist successfully. They, they yeah. The, the, my, my thing one's is... One's peanut butter, one's jelly. But my thing is that what makes Andor so special is Tony Gilroy and his team's like deep dive into almost the facts that seem almost uninteresting on the first pass and makes them into the stuff of of operatic legend, right? Like the... The, the, the money trail from Mon Mothma to the revolution and, and blow something up out of that. When Mandalorian goes deep, 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 deep into the details, it's the opposite effect of me. I'm less interested. Yeah. I'm less interested in these in in the tradition of these people who who put themselves in magic armor and they're like infighting over dark sabers. That you lost me. That is that is very, very far from the sort of lone wolf and cub show of wandering into different worlds that delighted me, frankly. Do you think it's like a show not tell thing? Or a tell not show thing where it's like in Andor, the depth of the show seems to be very much part and parcel with whatever the plot is. Like the the plot has this incredible richness of detail. Whereas in the Mandalorian, it's like people standing there and being like, You must go cleanse yourself in the yeah. in the sacred waters if you want to get it. Seem, into the group, you know, they like, seem like they're making it up as they go along. Also, well, not, no, I'm sure Filoni is like, Nope, you gotta get get in that that pool, sure, you know. But Great. Uh, yes, there is a lot of thought behind the making of the show. I don't mean to suggest otherwise, but there's just some stuff within. Like, so this season begins with the armor. She's making her little mask for uh-huh. her guy. They do the baptism ceremony. My thing is like, if you're going to have your baptism near the alligator pit, yeah, you should have a plan. You know what I mean? Like, you should have an escape strategy, or you should just be better at fighting alligators. Like, they seemed so surprised by that alligator. <sighs> What planet are they on? Because I was wondering whether or not no they're so like c- kind of down on their luck that the only spot they can get to do a ceremony is near the crocodile. Do you think, when you put it that way, it makes me feel like, are they just going around planet to planet, like finding the one kid who's just like, <laughs> this acne's terrible. I'm going to live in a mask for the rest of my life because I've got a dance coming up. Like over the ridge are the rest of the alligator hunters being like, where's Jake? <laughs> <laughs> I saw him wander into a cave with some armored lady. Like, I know he was to, really sweating that zit. They, <laughs> they need, like, where is the it gets better of that planet for the young people? The larger they become, point you're making, though, is uh-huh. about whether or not, like, whether or not, like, you want this to be like a week to week samurai western. Yeah. Or whether or not you want it to be about the creeds and codes and mythology of these ancient warriors. And like what they do or don't have to do to be part of certain tribes. And I think the meta text of what you're just saying is how much do I want the show to be about Dinjar and, and Grogu, who I have a lot of affection for and time for sure. and, and grief and these other characters that literally we've met. can't get enough of. Them. True. Or the larger meta story of the older religious tracts of High Priest Dave Filoni, right. who is in the background, and we know this from our good friend Mallory Rubin, who we just ran into, and you should absolutely be listening to her on the Ringerverse talk about the show in a completely different way than us. You know, he does seem to be using this show and the sequels and spinoffs as a way to make his Clone Wars cartoons flesh, to bring those stories yeah, to life. Ben Lindbergh did, when I was reading Lindbergh's recap on the Ringer, which people should definitely read because I think even the most, the most eagle-eyed viewers will probably learn a lot from reading Ben's stuff. Ben spent a lot of his time in his recap discussing a moment that I honestly didn't didn't register at all with me, which is this apparition that seems to appear to Grogu as they are in hyperspace. Yes. And it's like, oh, cool. Like, is this just like what? Like, there's just vibes out there? Space whales. It's a space whale. But the space whale is incredibly important to the Ezra, Bridger, Thrawn, like Ashoka type type jam yeah like that's that's bringing all and, that towards us and that is hugely significant and hugely meaningful to people who are invested in these stories and we're not litigating this anymore like i i am sure that the clone wars cartoons are incredible content and really entertaining and enjoyable probably not going to be watching them so i am going to continue to watch the show as someone who wants to be entertained for what it is and it doesn't fail at that 
but there begins to be this feeling that there is a larger hand at work here that I do feel slightly excluded from. Mm -hmm. So even the machinations of what Mando is doing, which is like he goes to visit Grief, which yeah. is great. In he order, wants to get a robot. But it, it needs to be the Taika bot. Well, because he doesn't trust other robots. See, you're already losing me. But here. even though, <laughs> but because yeah. he, he's had some bad experiences with them. During the five years we didn't see? No, when he was a kid. Remember? The droids show up oh, and like yeah. massacre his whole family. Look at you. Yeah. Look Remembering you. season w one of the Wikipedia. <laughs> Pretty impressed. And then, well, here's my thing. Yeah. First of all, why do you guys make Carl Weathers like get down on his knees to shout into that scene? Like, we just like on a blocking level? Like, can't that he was, just hang out? That was weird. Also, it, I feel like this is the third iteration of the Keebler elf fix people race in Star Wars. There was a little. Isn't that Babu? Yes. Right. Wait, is this him again? Are they no, the same I don't people? think it's the same guy, but I think it's like he's like his oh, cousin. Yeah. I thought they just invented more. Like more fucking fraggles that fix robots. And I'm like, <laughs> guys, you have a deep bench. A deep, deep bench. We don't need more. Do you think okay. they're unionized? Those I, guys? I want to say I hope so. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you no. Okay. <laughs> I'm definitely going to tell you no. But it's just a weird scene because he's like, yeah, I've got like a million droids for sure. Yeah. And and he's like, no, it has to be this one because we had that's a good already hang. had a homicidal psychotic break. Mm -hmm. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird. And but then he's, he's like, like, no problem. I'll just get in my spaceship and go find the part. I'm going to go on a repair run mm -hmm. for the first part of this boldly awaited season, but I'm going to make a quick pit stop and an abandoned planet yeah. that has a castle uh -huh. that just has a lady sitting on a chair. Right. With her leg just strewn over the, the arm. Do you think... So I didn't get this vibe from that scene, but I do wonder, like, did Bo-Katan hear the ship coming? And, and she's like, like oh, here, oh, shit, I got to look how casual. Do, how am I going to greet him? Yeah. yeah. Like, do you think she was... Because to hear her talk, she's like in a state of just abject... Oh, that's yeah. kind of like how, like, in seventh grade, I would always try to be like, when, when like, w girls would come into the gym, I'd yeah. be like, oh, I just finished that layup. You know, like... Just toweling <laughs> off? Just poor... Oh, you interrupted me. I was just lifting. Gosh, yeah. sorry. Just finishing my last set. And 20. Hey, what's up? Uh, Jessica, probably. <laughs> um, the thing that would have worked better for me is if Bo-Katan had been kind of like you in your Burbank COVID dungeon. Uh-huh. And then, like, the knock on the door for housekeeping. You're like, one second! <laughs> and, like, you choose the one thing that you could do to maybe make it seem like you weren't just eating goldfish crackers for yeah. the last 10 hours. I know, watching diners drive us in dives. <laughs> yeah. She was a little too put together. Sure. Waiting for that moment. Sure. But also, I... I don't know. I, so you don't know anything about the Darksaber. You don't know why it matters. I, maybe I, it doesn't matter. I did like the way... Um, Giancarlo Esposito and Gina Carano got written off the show. <laughs> oh, he's Mando. been reassigned. Yes. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Why am I trying to do your voice? But um, Mando, do you do you follow Ben Shapiro on Twitter? <laughs> yes. Have you heard of being red pilled, Mando? <laughs> Just doing her own research. She was. Can now I be she, positive also, for a second? Uh, right wing Yoda. Yeah. Uh, just love a an old Western style draw. So the Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess he's Jin, you know, like, but you know, him, him and grief versus the pirate guys. Yeah. Dug that. Love the music. Music's great. Pretty good crocodile. Pretty good. Pretty good CG across yeah. the board. They really spend on the show and you can see it, the space battle. Do you, I, you know, the one guy, the one pirate. The guy with the broccoli face. I love that guy. Yeah. More of him. hundred <laughs> percent. Sorry. Just wanted to say, that's what I love. I love that guy. Yeah. I do think you're that, a little bit of a Trekkie, though. You love a you love a weird looking dude. Well, but no, a Trekkie would be like if he just had a couple ridges on his nose, and they'd be like, "Wow, how exotic!" Yeah, because they couldn't afford the full broccoli yeah. face paint. The logistics of a space battle in a world where you can just flip a switch and vanish to the sure. other side of the universe has never fully made sense to me. Um, my thing was, you're asking about the unionization of the droid fixers. <laughs> I feel like the pirate guild has a real grievance to file against this guy, just in terms of respect of the employee in human life. Uh -huh. He rolls with six dudes. I'm not sure that those guys are the sharpest sticks I've ever seen. They all get gunned They're down. They're like, we need to go to the bar. And he's like, well, that's a school now. He's like, well, we'll be drinking there. And it's like, but do they, they don't serve alcohol here. <laughs> like, what, like what? This is such a weird conflict. We will be smoking in the boys' room. <laughs> that's a great song once. Um, and then he goes into space with four more guys. So what was the recruiting mission being like? He comes back alone to uh -huh. the pirate guild and he's just like, you four, follow me. 
Was there any moment where they were like, <laughs> what happened to what happened to like Tom and yeah. the rest of them? Yeah. And then they go into space. And again, I think that you would, th- I want to say, I want to big up you here. I think you would thrive in this universe because I think you're good at a lot of things. Okay. I feel like even if I was good at like laser gunfights, which I am not, but if I was, I don't think I would then also be good at space piloting. Oh, yeah. You have I to mean, be good at so many things are, to survive. You have to be a five-tool player to, That's to my live point. in Star Wars, yeah. Or, or then you wind up being Amy Sedaris. You know what I mean? So she's like, in the baseball analogy, she's a loogie. Like, she just has her one thing. Yeah, she she's does. like a submarine pitcher comes in, specialist, eighth inning, gets one guy, gets yanked. And Jin is Trey Turner. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, that makes sense to me. I just, I, my thing about the show is, it is so good at being itself that it is not bad. I, I know that I've been, I've been making jokes and I'm not feeling it as much as I did the prior seasons. It's so, it's such a quality product. It, it knows what it is. It has fun doing it. I'm always excited to see who shows up and what kind of green stuff is on their face. But there has been a little Was bit Was that of guy a, famous? No. Okay. I mean, what am I saying? No. 100% <laughs> no. Let me click on Ben Lindbergh's Twitter. Oh, it was Brian Cox. <laughs> that's the most important person ever to be in Star Wars. Yeah. Um, no, it's just that there was a little bit of a bait and switch that was done very well, where it isn't the show that it was at the beginning. Yeah. It has become subsumed into this larger narrative that may be the smarter play for the show, yeah, I think for the, the streaming that, service. That seal got broken. Uh, when Luke showed when, up. When nephew Kyle spoiled Luke coming back for me. Did, yeah. he, sp- did he spoil that for you? Did you remember? I was like, I got, I got on Twitter at like 8 a.m. for yeah. some reason, and Kyle's just like, damn, it's Luke! <laughs> <laughs> Have you, did he, we we just ran into Kyle on Monday. Yeah. Did, did you bring it up or have you, you mended I, things? I mean, you can't blame a guy, you know? Sometimes you just get excited. You tweet. Does he have a tattoo about that as well? <laughs> no. Like Luke showing up no, on he, But that wouldn't be a big deal. It's like if he had a tattoo and it was like, one day Luke Skywalker will come back, oh, this tattoo will be relevant. It wouldn't have and been. That's his, what happened with Tate. Okay, they both come back. The two princes who were promised. Yeah, I, so that's that's my thing. It's just this is... We're not out on the show. I'm not out on this show. We're I, I it. just, I just felt the the. I felt this show, like you said, get subsumed into the larger mm-hmm. Filoni verse, and also there was a little bit of like, did I miss four episodes? Which I did. <laughs> Which apparently you I did. did. I I did. I did like it when Grogu tries to take the little workers as I, pets. That's fucking awesome, man. That was so great. I, well, I showed my wife that, and she was just like, "This is the best show on television." She loves. It. Do you do just a supercut of just? Grogu's I just content? go in with like, I'll just like shock her with it because she won't know what's going on, and I'll just be like, hit play, and then Baby Yoda hugs a hugs a mechanic. Have I have I told you? Uh, I know we got to get into my interview with Nick, but I have I told you my 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 billion dollar pitch to the Lucasfilm guys. I told you that my wife Phoebe, she really wants Bill to have Baby Yoda on his podcast. Like she thinks it's like. <laughs> What would they what would they talk about? Celtics. Is, is, yeah, is, is Grogu a big yeah. body language guy? Like, you imagine Grogu on Marin, who are your guys? And he's like, well, Obi-Wan Kenobi, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> the whole Skywalker thing. That was big for me. <laughs> um, no, I just think that it's time for a, a major rebrand for the kids to ke- get the old, the original trilogy back. And what you do is you rebrand Yoda as old Grogu. Oh, yeah. That's so just, the rebrand. That would get your daughters interested? No, they don't care about any of this magic boy stuff. They they're out. Okay, but I think that's you can have that idea for free. We don't need it because we're buying AMC. <laughs> Thanks uh, to Kai McMullen for producing yet another Sterl- really buttoned up episode of the Watch. Sterling and focused episode. The uh, Watch enjoy Andy's conversation with Nick Kroll coming up. We'll be back on Monday to talk about The Last of Us and hopefully maybe some Daisy Jones, maybe some Perry Mason. We got we got a lot of shows coming up, so Andy's going to be busy. Can't wait. I lo- the thing, I love watching TV. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. 
They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. This episode is brought to you by the new true crime docuseries, American Nightmare, only on Netflix. In 2015, the Vallejo, California Police Department received a strange phone call about a kidnapping. But when the truth is stranger than fiction, you won't know who to trust or what is real. A fast-paced true crime thriller with cliffhangers at every turn. Watch American Nightmare now, only on Netflix. Have you ever spotted McDonald's hot, crispy fries right as they're being scooped into the carton? And time just stands still. All right, so I am thrilled to welcome back to the podcast the executive producer and one of the stars of the fantastic new Hulu series, History of the World Part Two, Nick Kroll, back on The Watch. Thanks for coming back on. You know what? I've been counting down the days. It's been, I think, 536 days since I was last on the pod, so I'm happy to be back, and we can start We can start the count over again. We can finally, yeah, how many days since a lost time incident? It's actually been longer. I checked. I think it's been five years. I, I, I As I was saying it, I was like, that's like, that's like peak pandemic 536 <laughs> days ago. I probably wasn't. I wasn't slinging any content at that moment. So no, you you uh, you and Jason years. came on to talk about Big Mouth premiering. Yes, wow. Prior Whoa. to that, you came on graciously to talk. Maybe you've been on more than because I think you came on to talk Kroll Show. But there was another time when you came on to promote Uncle Drew. Of course, some people you know say that you you get you don't get paid to do the work you do. You get paid to do the press. For me. Like, and I don't consider this press. This is a conversation between friends, yeah. between colleagues, between peers, and dare I say, and dare I say too much, between lovers. And here we are. But for me, I do the work so that I can go, not do this, but like, you know, the five, 10 minute junket interviews, mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, in a room, like that, that's what I'm really in it for. I, I could care less about the work. Do you keep up with Kyrie? I was realizing that, like, you know, he's had an interesting arc <laughs> since you guys worked together. I don't know if you want to take any responsibility for that, but I mean, we do a podcast, just a private podcast between <laughs> us. Uh, it's not for the world, mainly because of the things, if you can believe it, because of the things I say. Yeah, because yeah. of my, my my takes and stances. It's really it's really tricky because you know I really. I really enjoyed like working with him. I love watching him play basketball. Yeah. He's a really interesting, smart fella, but he he's not making it easy to root for him. I honestly could keep talking to you about Kyrie Irving for the rest of our allotted time, but I do think there's an opportunity for a segue here to basically say that your IMDb page may be undefeated because it goes from Kyrie Irving to Mel Brooks. Um, <laughs> perhaps the only person who can wrap his arms around both those things. So you're here today to talk about this History of the World Part Two, which is fantastic. Thank um, you. I love it so much. I've watched half of the season. We should say we're running this on Thursday. The show premieres on Hulu uh, this coming Monday, so we won't give too many spoilers, although it's not really a spoiler-centric really. show. It's history. It's all, it's out there's there. There's like a couple of, there's a couple of things like that are, uh, you know, that I'm sure you've like when you do like there are embargoes yes. on a couple things that can't be spoiler alerts that I'm like, you know, it's very funny. It was decided at some point through the spoiler alerts and, I'm, and they're like, we can't talk about this. And it's just so funny to think of our show as like as if it was like the the last of us or something where it's like we cannot spoil what happens in the final episode of History of the World Part Two. The, the way you treat Rasputin is so wild. We can't. It's. <laughs> Johnny Knoxville as Rasputin <laughs> is truly the part he was born to play. Um, so for people who don't know, and I, I hope more people do, so this is this is a a sequel in all ways to Mel Brooks's film History of the World Part One, which was released in 1981. Um, mm-hmm. Let's take this your connection to this all the way back. So what did you think of that movie when you were three years old? 
I, I mean, we own that movie on VHS. And so like, it was one of like three movies that I think we owned that, you know, it was like that top secret, uh, you know, I think like a Monty Python movie and then it slowly expanded, but that was like one of our first VHS. So I wore, I, I wore that VHS down more than like the one, uh, porn I had, you know, later in life or like, you know what it was truly was Caddyshack, the scene where they have sex with Lacey, you know, and that like that. So those two history of the world and Caddyshack, the sexy, not even the comedy part where the big, just like, you know, when you had tracking on your VHS, like it would start to get like, oh, yeah. did, did Kentucky fried that. movie play into your, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That Kentucky was the one you rented at sleepovers. That Yes. Yes. Like, I don't think we were allowed to own that no. one, but <laughs> yeah. we definitely, okay. So, good. uh, so that movie was incredibly important to me as, as, a, as, a, as not, maybe not three, but probably by, I was like, started maybe watching that around five or six. And then really all of Mel's movies, especially the, the producers, Young Frankenstein, Blazing Saddles, and History of the World, those four, I definitely owned and listened and watched, I mean, watched incessantly, you know, like no, most of those movies by heart. And so that it was a very crazy uh, incoming call that was like Mel Brooks would like to do History of the World Part Two with you. Uh, it was very surreal. So that's really how it happened. You just, it was just a... MB's online too. He wants to talk to you about this. Did you have any history? Did you have any connection to him online at all? Because I have a I have a multi phone, <laughs> yeah. like an office phone in my house. I, 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 you're a busy guy. I assume you do. Uh, I have, I do roll calls in my office. Um, uh, yeah, it was sort of an it was an incoming from Mel and from Searchlight uh, Television, and it was yeah, it was crazy. It was and it was and I I had met Mel a few times. Like I I. Uh, and that's why I call him Mel. You know, that's why I call him like we're we're dear friends. You know, Mel and Marty and I. Yeah. I'm not talking about Martin Scorsese though. I'm I'm talking about Martin Screlly. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> it's me, you, Mel and Marty. You all listen to the one Wu Tang album together. <laughs> exactly. It was down to it was that's what we we bonded over us all bidding on the <laughs> Wu Tang album. And Marty got it. You know, he obviously he's the biggest fan. Um, but no, it was so then it was like Mel was like uh, you know, Mel and Searcher like you want to do this and I was like yep and oh, wait, we I, I'm sorry I want to go run it back just one like when you you said you met him a couple of times like do, oh. does he keep does he keep track of like young handsome Jewish comedians like yourself like what is his oh. what is his you're so kind you're so kind <laughs> to add young and handsome this, and and talented this is how I get all. you to open up to me about basketball players you've met right yeah <laughs> yeah let me let me tell you how I've been. F- feeding Kyrie his research. <laughs> yeah. He had, he had seen, Oh, hello. And I had met with him and, and uh, I, you know, I think he keeps up. I mean, he like, you know, I had heard that years before it was like, Oh, Mel likes to take meetings, you know? So I met him at a, at an Emmys party and, and his uh, producing partner is this guy, Kevin Salter. And so I met him at this Emmy party and, and I told uh, Kevin, like, if, if Mel ever wants to sit down and talk, like, I, you know what I mean? And they, he was like, great. And we got one on the books and he he gave us raisinets at the end of the meeting. And he came and saw, Oh, hello uh, in LA. And I saw him at like radio city, did a live screening of blazing saddles. And so so we, you know, we had some version of a, but the first time I met him was like 20 years ago at this like event, this, uh, like the Jewish humor awards. And I went up to him and I, the producers is kind of my all time favorite movie. Like literally the, the, the original producers that, that movie really like go really went quite deep for me. And, um, and I, and I had an idea for, I would just graduated college, moved to New York and was like starting to come and I had an, I had an idea for the producers, like a remake of it, which I still think is, is a good idea, uh, which Kyrie and I are currently writing. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, he's the guy uh, on spec. Um, and I went up to him as he was leaving and I was like, uh, Mr. Brooks, I, I'm, I'm big fan. He's like, uh-huh. Great. Yeah. And I said, I have an idea how to remake the producers. And he's like, go do your own work. And then walked out and my brother was there with me that night, my brother, Jeremy, and he was, and as my, as Mel was walking out, he goes, work, 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 work. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, from uh, Blazing Saddles and Mel laughed at that. And I was like, fuck, I blew it. You know, my brother won. 
Uh, and then look who came crawling back <laughs> 20 years ago. But he was like, do your work. And he was, that was the right advice. Like, go do your own thing, figure out who you are. And then, you know, at some point, this other thing might happen, you know? And yeah. And then we started to put together the whole kind of operation and team around it and went to Wanda Sykes, um, who was like, yep, yeah, absolutely. And, she, you know, she's a big Mel Brooks fan and the funniest person. I mean, just so funny and such a good like producer and such a good partner. And, and then these two guys won this fan contest, uh, Ike Barinholtz and Dave Stassen. Uh, they both put up 30, it was an omaze, uh, <laughs> uh, thing. And, you know, it, you could raffle it off. You $10 raffle. And if you won, you know, you got to be a producer and writer and star of, um, uh, history of the world part two. And otherwise, you know, money would go to a charity. Um, what a return on investment for, for what was his, what was his name? It was Mike Barinholtz. Mike Baron, Berenstein, Mike Berenstein. No, uh, yeah. Mike, Mike Berenstein, not Jewish. Mike, not Jewish, weirdly. As, as, a, as a parent, a I feel like you're very aware of the, the difference of the Berenstein Bear books before and after Mike took over. Absolutely. And, and Ike Barinholtz, however, Jewish, always, you never, you, you, he's so tall, you don't think of him as Jewish. Uh, but but we brought in Ike uh, and his writing partner, Dave Stassen, to like, you know, uh, write and for Ike to star and for them to, you know, run it with me. And and um, and 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 then we just, you know, assembled the rest of the team. But it was that was sort of it. And then we kind of figured out what how to do, like, how do you do this sequel 42 years in the making of a of a movie, a sketch movie? And it was actually sort of we sort of we tried to follow the format of the movie, which is all these shorter sketches and then these bigger chunks around the uh, Roman empire and, and the French revolution. And so each episode hopefully feels like a mini version of the movie where you're in these shorter, like one-off just historical sketches. And then these like bigger storylines that cover mainly like four big stories that are sort of sprinkled in and out throughout the season, each episode. It's one of the most pleasurable things I've watched in a really long time. It is so funny but it, to speak to the the format, it's it's honestly ideal and feels like a really wonderful corrective because you you start an episode and it's delightful not having any idea what's going to happen next, where you're going to be, mm-hmm. who's going to be in it, what they're going to be mm-hmm. doing, and how long you'll have them for. And then mm-hmm. and then interspersed with these little pops, you get the ongoing saga of your own, perhaps your greatest character, um, Schmuck Mudman. Um, <laughs> You know, and 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 you get that you get you 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 get the serialized storytelling like you would in say The Last of Us, but you sure, have exactly. but, <laughs> similar stakes, very similar. Um, no, but it, it's just it's what you want to watch, honestly, at this moment, the way it's laid out. Thank you. That that makes me happy to hear. It was you know like Mel beyond the format. Like when you watch, it was like cause people were like, "Why are you doing history?" It's an interesting time to do history. Quote history of the world now. And I think what was helpful is when you go back and watch Mel's stuff, it's like, he really, he's very, he's not political and he's never been like overtly political or preachy at all. He's making incisive political, he's making social commentary, but it's never at the expense of being like silly and really like, he just wants to be funny first and silly. And he wants to be sort of provocative and push some buttons, but it's like all in genuinely all in good fun and I think we try to take that ethos, especially right now, to make a show that is just kind of like fun and silly. And yes, it's about history and like you're, we're, you know, we're making, trying to make a few points here and there. But really, it's like just like make something that's like hopefully just sort of pleasurable to watch and not to, you know, because I like I like my serious comedy, like the best of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love my dramedies. You know, I love my dramedies. Um, Those hands can't be heavy like, enough. You yeah. Like real. Real weighty. Yeah, I, I want I want my comedy serious and my one hours light. <laughs> you know me, and that's what Kyrie and I are endeavoring to do uh, <laughs> with The Last of Us, uh, <laughs> the movie. It, it was is, brave of you not to take a credit on the series. I just think your contributions are being felt. Um, we were just because we were there. It's just to you know, you know, and obviously Kyrie <laughs> had some thoughts about just like how the Earth should yeah, look. It's a little like, too round. <laughs> It's um, it's so weird that I'm sort of going. It's just he's, he, you know, it's hard not to talk about him. Um, but yeah, we so we sort of built around that ethos from Mel and 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 tried to follow through. And it is sort of like sprinkled whether you're like watching a short sketch with, 
you know, Seth Rogen is Noah's, you know, Noah's Ark or Taika is, you know, Freud or Kumail in the Kama Sutra or, you know, Hannah Einbinder is like Amelia Earhart with, you know, those kinds of like one-offs. And then you've got these bigger stories with always, I always build my character from the name up. So, <laughs> you know, other people are like, what does he wear? Where, what is, where is he from? What were his family? I'm like, what's his name is Schmuck Mudman. And then what can we do around that? Uh, you know, again, was that your role as showrunner as well? You throw the name on the table and you walk out. I mean, I mean, to be, if I, if I'm going to share all my trade secrets, <laughs> I'm not above it. <laughs> I'm not above it. So, it, but like, just to, to wrap your arms around something like this, when you can, with the creativity in the room, cover anything in the history of, of the world, is Mel and his sensibility the North Star of a project like this? Like, it, it is. Yeah, I think he, you know, I mean, it, it, it both, it is in that you're like, you're doing History of the World Part Two and Mel Brooks movie, and you're doing something that is like very much like Mel Brooks branded. That is the priority, I think. Like, and and both because it's his thing and also because like frankly i can't help but do mel brooks-esque material like i just can't help it like it's it's so deep in my comedy dna but then you also want to make a show that feels like relevant now and it you know takes advantage of everything you know so there's a lot of like current sort of genre pieces and and, and again mel was like whether it's in history of the world where he's doing like the inquisition, which feels like a Busby Berkeley number or, <laughs> you know, the, the Roman empire, which feels like Spartacus or, you know, like we're, we're doing, you know, you're doing Kublai Khan, but you're also doing like the real concubines of Kublai Khan uh, with Andy Cohen, in this case, Andy Khan at the center of like a reunion show. And so you're just sort of like, all right, that'll be our way into doing sort of all of the many wives that Kublai Khan had, you know, like, but what's incredible about it to me is, you, I mean, you're right. Like you can, especially when watching like a Mel Brooks movie now, you can see the DNA and the influence on on your work and on a lot of other comedians that that I love. I'm sure listeners love and can identify as well. But this piece doesn't, it never feels like you're doing pastiche or doing an imitation. Honestly, the feeling I got was everyone felt, it felt really relaxed. Like almost as if you mm-hmm. finally had permission to give full voice to this instinct that's been in your head and everyone's like everybody right, leans right. all the way in and I, again we're not spoiling things that we're not supposed to spoil but like alexander graham bell invents the telephone and then within you know two and a half minutes is fucking the telephone yeah you yeah. know it's like yeah you you could finally do these things you know well, it, I think like it's the, the limited stuff on twitter that i have allowed myself to read leading up to it is like you know, you better, and again, no spoilers, embargoes and no spoilers. You know, they're like, you better, if like, I've been waiting 42 years for Hitler on ice and Jews in space and like, stick around everybody (laughs) is what I'll say. And then, and also like, you can't make a Mel Brooks thing now with the political woke, the police, (laughs) all the, all the, the police who are politically woke and correct and like, I'm sort of like, I think we know we relaxed and we were like, no, we're going to, I think you can still be provocative and fuck around. And, you know, like you're going to watch Alexander Graham Bell fuck, fuck a phone. Like you're going to, don't worry, don't worry. You're going to have to um, see it. Yeah. That's one of my favorite skits. It's, I, and again, part of the relaxedness is that is you've got Ike Barinholtz working with Sam Richardson, who they've known each other forever and they were in the after party together. And so you're just like watching two buddies, you know, fuck around and fuck a phone like, you know, as Alexander Graham Bell and, and his associate Watson and is it Watson or is that, am I, is it also Watson the it same is. as it is? It's a little, yeah. The, it's based on that guy Richie movie, right? Yes. Sherlock, yeah. We should right? note That's, that it's a little repetitive, I think. Um, <laughs> but there's also a sense, you know, it can go two ways when you watch a bunch of people who know each other, especially in comedy, having a good time, it can be either, totally exhilarating and ecstatic to be watching it or it can feel a little like well, these guys are having a good time mm-hmm. this is defiantly the former it is really joyful and i wondered what it was I, it can't have it can't have been a series of hard phone calls getting the incredible cast you got to do this i mean I, yeah I, I mean it's you, you know between me and wanda and ike and dave like we all have good relationships with different you know different sort of groups of people inside of comedy and so they were so in general, you know, and, and also like we've done a lot of people like some solids are like, yeah, I'll come do, you know, like, and so 
those calls are are not always hard for us to make, but they're not. But then, but truly, it's like you when you're calling, being like, I'm calling about a Mel Brooks project, like everything sort of changes. So the speed with which you get a return call or like, let me see if I can make this work. It was, you know, like we have, you know, Jack Black is Joseph Stalin mm-hmm. and sings like this very emotional, like Les Mis song called Someday about I was going to finally get to kill all his enemies. And it's like, you know, Jack is a busy man. <laughs> and he's like, I, I'll figure this out. I can make this work, you know? And then I got to like, you know, Mel was not on set, but I got to like FaceTime Jack with Mel and like watch them talk about, you know, Jack was telling Mel about like, you know, how Ann Bancroft came backstage when he was doing a play in high school. Cause like Matt, uh, Jack was in the play, I think with Max Brooks, Mel, Mel and, and son. And, and he was like, you know, and Ann gave us like a pep talk right before we did this play, having, she had just come off Broadway and it's just, and you're just like hearing this story of, of Jack recounting it to Mel and Mel, it was just like, there are moments like that where you're like, I can't believe I'm somehow in the, in, in the middle of it, privy to these really kind of beautiful moments. So there's a lot of moments like that. Then people want to, people just like want to show up for Mel. Danny DeVito is like, yeah, I'll come. Mel's got to do this thing for me and I'll come and do that. And we're like, great. So then you got Danny DeVito's czar Nicholas. What's it like make, making Mel Brooks laugh? I'm yet to find out. I'm excited to <laughs> see is. once the show comes out. No, there's like, you know, he like there's a moment if you're pitching him jokes where you know a lot of it was over zoom because we start we did most of this through you know the process started in like 2020 and a lot of it was over zoom and he like you'll pitch it if a joke hits he like he'll throw his head back and you're like i can't i just made you know like seeing mel brooks like throw his head back at, at, at something you've said is very gratifying the other side of that is like we you know i directed him he does all the voice or he narrates the whole show kind of like Orson Welles did the move, the original history of the world movie. And, and Mel does this. And, and, you know, so I had to direct him doing the voiceover and either give him a note on like a, how to say something or pitch him a joke. And sometimes you get, he'd get a note and be like, great. Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. yeah. And then you, I'd be like, Hey Mel, you want to try something where you're like, and you know, but the tuna fish was too hot for the man. And he's like, that's stupid. You know, like, <laughs> savage yeah well he's just like the combination of him being mel brooks and also like 96 there's just like no time for bullshit do you think he had a favorite bit in this new series that's something that really tickled him or 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 surprised him um it's a good question um you know he was just throughout we'd be sort of doing like what about this and that and he'd be like he it's interesting because like the movie is built around these like every man comicus or the piss boy and inside of this world where they then come into contact with Caesar or, mm-hmm. you know, Marie Antoinette, Louis the 14th, 16th, whatever. Um, but he was like, he was also like, give them the hits. Like, don't, you know, I'd be like, it's about this guy who's in the middle, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's like, they, people want to see Hitler. They want to see, you know, they want to see FDR, like give them the P you know, Jesus. Like he, he was good at keeping us focused on like the, the, the big stuff, you know, I mean, he, he did like, I, we do a parody of in the story of Jesus and Mary, a bunch of different, each episode is sort of a different parody of them. So it's like the, the, uh, there's one we did called curb your Judaism where I'm Judas. It's very special. It's a Larry David S character. And I, we were like, should we ask Larry to do it? And I was like, I think the nicest thing we can do for Larry David is not ask him and force him to say no to us. You know what I mean? <laughs> But you can't do curb without J kind of without JB Smoove, and we got JB to do it. So like once JB's in, it's like okay, we can do this very silly curb your enthusiasm thing. And Richard Kind is in it. It feels like you're watching, you know. It, um, it's it's so great. It's uh, <laughs> it's really funny. And I'm Judas, so I'm Larry playing Judas, and he doesn't want to wash feet. He doesn't want to wash Jesus's feet. Basically, goes along, and then some other insane stuff. But um, we do that. We do a. a the notebook of Mary, kind of a parody of, you know, Mary, Mary Magdalene and the notebook. And then the Beatles documentary. I don't know if you've gotten to that yet, but <laughs> like there was a, we were all watching the get back doc while we were writing it. And we we're like, Oh, it's the Jesus in like the last supper sessions. So it's all <laughs> of us. doing. And then anyway, 
the point being, uh, I don't even remember the point, what, uh, whatever it was. Uh, it was probably something. Well, it was Mel. It was like, I was curious what's surprising. Falsely humble and self-aggrandizing at the same time. <laughs> which, you know, which we have, we probably have five, ten more minutes of that. But like, but but for like Mel, it was more like what surprised him, what tickled him, what where did he, you know, did he push you? Oh, right. So we were just talking about J.B. Smoove and just like, it's just, J.B. is just the funniest person. He's just, and we were just, yeah, we were just talking about how how funny he is and everything and, Mel, and he really makes Mel laugh. and. You know, I think he really like loves, you know, Wanda and we have the Wanda does this Shirley Chisholm. We do this sort of Shirley Chisholm thing as, as done as like a kind of Norman Lear 70s sitcom style. And one of the episodes we have George Wallace, you know, in Shirley Chisholm that ran for first black woman to in Congress. She runs for president in the late 60s, early 70s. And she um she visited George Wallace, the racist governor of Alabama, when they were when he was uh, he was shot. And it was like a real weird thing for both of their constituents and their, you know, their base. Um, so we were like, all right, we'll do that. And I think the best casting for George Wallace, the racist Alabama governor, was to cast George Wallace, the uh, black comedian, uh, the funniest man on Twitter and maybe the funniest man alive. George Wallace is. So funny. So we were like, let's cast him as George Wallace. And, and I think there are things like that, that Mel, you know, like is tickled by, or, you know, Marla Gibbs is in it also. And Shirley. and like, I think there's just, I think there's like, hopefully like different gen- people from different generations can kind of enjoy the the folks that they would recognize. Was this done with a, this is obviously a very premature question, but was this done with the hope that there would be a part three or was this more of like, you know, a, a bookend on the first one? I think it was like, I think for us, at least for me, it was like, let's just do this right. And then we can see what happens. Although I did see Mike Lee and Black tweeted something that was like, they should have called it history of the world part one, part two. And I was like, that's very funny. I was like, yeah. That's, I mean, you're just doing your own research on Twitter though. You're getting the reviews, (laughs) epidemiologists, Michael Ian Black, George Wallace. Yeah, the state, people don't know this, but the state is flat. And I think I've said everything correct there. I think I've gotten all right. Yeah, I think that's right. Right? Um, Stella is flat. Stella, yes. God, big state. I'm a big state fan. So this is your first time back on the podcast since you became a father, Mazel Tov. Thank um, you. I, this is a semi-serious question. You can answer it in a, you know, in a, in a uh, dramedy way, tragic comedy, mm-hmm. however you feel. But I am curious how it's affected your creativity and devotion of your energies. Because one thing that I really do admire about you is when you come with a new project, it se- you seem to put your energies in creativity into the best baskets. I'm sure it's not the same from your perspective, but it's like the stand-up sh- special last year it's fantastic. Uh-huh. And then this year I have this show and you have Big Mouth sort of percolating in the background. You did Oh Hello with Mulaney. It seems to be like you're finding ways to do to express your creativity in different ways, different mediums, mm. and keep it moving. As someone with two human children, that does affect one's ability to keep anything moving. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. how you've how you've rolled with that. Um, thank first off, thank you. And second off, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, no, it is. I mean, it changes like you know, I we really had this, we had our son almost simultaneously, like I think we found out that that my wife was pregnant almost at the same time we got the call about this show. I mean, they almost, they're almost exactly the same age. Um, and I'm really proud of one of them. So I will let you, the audience decide. Let history decide, honestly, make yeah, him, make him work for it. I cared about this show or my child. And, uh, but, but, you know, truthfully it was, so th- there was a learning curve to it and, you know, it's tricky. I'm assuming all of us are feeling like, I had the, our son, you know, at the in the middle of the pandemic, which was incredibly scary, but also like this real consolidated time. And even when we were working and writing this, we were writing from home. The world was slower in general. So it was even in production, it was still hard. It was not easy to do, but it was also like manageable. What's becoming, I assume we're all kind of dealing with is like the world truly opening back up and everything is expected of us again And now you have to like work and go places. And also, you know, I have, he's like two. And so he requires different levels of energy than what, you know, what previously, but, 
But I think maybe, I mean, I've always heard this and I guess I'm starting to figure it out. It's like, you just become more efficient with your time. You know, like, you're just like, I don't have like a day to fuck off to figure something out. It's like, no, I have these two and a half hours to figure this out. You know, I, I've heard that. I'm almost 10 years deep in the game. I still haven't figured that out. But I, yeah. I cling to everyone saying this. I, I do too. And I don't know if it's real, but I do think it is. I mean, truthfully, the way I, I've been able to, besides the stand up, which um, is like, you know, trying to really find great collaborators and partners and make things with people. And, you know, in this case between obviously Mel at the top of it all, but like Ike and Dave and Wanda and, and like everyone else we had involved in the show, it made it so that I was like, I'm not carrying this entire thing on my shoulders. And also in hiring good people, part of that is like having everyone have the same ethos about how you make something, which is like, let's go do our best, but also let's all acknowledge that we have families and our crew has families and life is only so long and we're making a sketch comedy show. And like, if you're efficient with your time and you plan yourself out, you don't have to like have like 15 hour writing days and 16 hour shoot days. Like you just like do your job, you know, responsibly and, and hopefully decently. And like everyone can be home for dinner. You know, I think it would be harder to explain to like a gaffer or a key grip that they can't see their kid that night because you have six actors vomiting in a made up uh, DJ boat, but they're not <laughs> vomiting because they're seasick. It's just because they had bad oysters and be like, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Keith, I'm sorry. Well, like, my Keith, point is like, no, yeah. If you, if you plan correctly and you do your puke tests the day before, <laughs> you can do that D day sketch in like, you know, quarter of a day, half a day, you know? Yeah. Uh, and everyone can be home for dinner and think about all of the puke they saw earlier that's, in the day. That's just called being a professional. That's <laughs> but, it, it, but it is like, and that's like, you know, Dave Stassen directed that piece. He had a good idea. You know, it's like, you just plan, you know, but, and also like, I think it's also, again, what you were saying like early on of like this, like in this case, like we are making a silly show, let it be loose and silly. And like, don't like make sure it looks and feels exactly like it's supposed to look like, but like also like, just have fun. And if it's fun, like things don't take like an insane amount of time to do. By, by the way, you talk about things opening up again. The, I, I was, it was two days ago that I realized things were really opened up again when I saw that 96 year old American treasurer Mel Brooks was at your premiere party. That's when I knew yeah. that well, we're back. We, I know. Well, we had the, yeah, we had the premiere on Monday and, 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 you know, it was like, it was always like Mel's a game time decision if he's going to come or not. Cause he's, he's amazing. He's, he's in great mental and physical shape, but he's 96. And it was like, it doesn't look like Mel's coming. And we we're like, okay, great. And then, and then like literally like less than an hour before it's like Mel is coming to the premiere and all of a sudden like my little butthole tightened up and I was like, Oh my God. Okay. You know? And then we all, you know, we're all saying hello and taking pictures and, you know, saying hi to the, he, he's come down to sort of glad hat, you know, say hi to everyone. And, and he had a video prepared. So we played the video and then he got up and spoke. I was like, Oh, we got one more person to say hi. And he got up and <laughs> he started, he just started talking about the weather and like what the weather was going to be like the next few days. Um, and it's so funny. I mean, it's just like, you're like, Oh, he's 96 and he's still just like off the cuff killing. You know, he's like, it should, anyway, it should clear up by Wednesday. So we're excited to be here tonight. You know, and it's, <laughs> he's still, he's still so funny and he showed up and the world was open and I got to see him yesterday and, and he's just got so much life in him. You know, you got to work with comedy dad. I really did. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. Congratulations pretty great. on this. Thank you. Thank you. Which conspiracy theories would you like to come back on the pod to discuss next? Uh, you know, just it, it's open for you. Uh, the lab leak stuff is getting a lot of burn right now. I don't know if you want to weigh in on any of that. I'd you love know. to. I I feel terrible because I'm like a I'm like a lab stand. You know, like some people are like I'm like a Disneyland guy. Yeah. You know, like I go to every major league baseball stadium. I go to like um, uh, chemical labs. I go to like a uh, uh, disease. What do they call that? Uh, infectious disease labs. Like yeah. that's sort of my like thing. And so I was in China and I went to that lab just to like check it out yeah. as a fan. 
and um and i bought like a i bought like one of those you know like a, a thermal thermos you know like a coffee cup yeah uh, and, an algene i think yeah an algene i got an algene there and and took it out like snuck it out because i was like they didn't want and and i guess i so i started i guess i technically started it this has been huge for me because the way you feel about like infectious disease labs i feel about wet markets and it's been hard for me these last three years and finally i feel justified because like it's just my thing. It, I, you you can't make the market wet enough for me. I hate no. a dry market. Well, it's funny. Some people like a farmer's market, but there's something about a wet market that it's just so wet. So, it's just and, I, juicy. and, I, and yeah. I guess we are the Venn diagram. I bring it, you know, because then we meet up. Yeah. You know, you and I, we do like to go to the wet market just to see what's new and what's, what's wettest. And, and but I honestly, bring my it, Aldine, it's, you know, why, it's, and, it's why we kept running into each other in Wuhan because it's the rare place where you get both. And by the way, I've been talking to Marty Screlly about the Wuhan clan, which is a <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> we did it. We finally did it. Well, we finally closed the loop. I'm I'm proud of us. I'm proud of you. I love the show, and I'm Thank so you. happy to talk to you about it. Thank you, Nick. Really, a four night it. event. A four night event on Hulu: History of the World Part Two. Uh, thank you genuinely for chatting, and and uh, I hope it's I come back here much sooner than. Uh, five years. It'll be 500 days. We've set the clock. 500 days of summer. This is the follow-up. It's me and you uh, <laughs> in a rom-com. You get to be Jogo. I'm 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 Zoe in a in Wuhan uh, at the wet market with Marty Screlly trying to get just, us back together. Just a plate of pangolin between us. We're Lady in the yeah. Tramping it, and and Marty charging an ar- a literal arm and a leg to get the <laughs> to get the vaccines. For those pangolins. Uh, Beloved figure, Martin Shkreli. Just universally yeah. curating through the roof. I feel terrible, by the way. I pi- I'm i pitching. This is basically the Kyrie project that I've been working on. So like, I'm, I'm pitching it without him, and I feel bad about it. But he gets it. We can circle back with him, you know. Well, when's he coming on? Is he on the next one? What's he? Is he on the next one? He's actually in Studio 5. He's next door. So thank you, Nick. Thanks for having me, Eddie. 